Good morning. I think we're going to go ahead and get started this morning. It's great to see everybody here. Hope your summer's off to a good start. Um, I think maybe we could just stand and then um, I'll open us with a word of prayer and then we'll worship together. Father, we invite you into this place. Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and fall. Just be amongst us as we worship, as we listen to your word, and as we um, engage with you and with your presence this morning. Lord, may everything we do this morning glorify your name. Amen. Holy trust in our God. Jesus is greater, we can do all things. All those against him will fall, for our God is stronger, he can do all things. No higher name we can call, but Jesus is
prayers together one more time, just the voices. For we trust in our God, and through his unfailing love, we will
the name of Jesus, all darkness, all fear, all chains are broken. We're so thankful, Lord, for your name, for the power and authority of the name of Jesus. We speak that over our lives this morning. We thank you that whoever calls on the name of Jesus will be free. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. You can turn and greet each other this morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to Risen King. Um, I don't know if you saw in the bagel room this morning, but I think someone has it out for me because there's pastries and muffins that are not normally there. And so I think someone's trying to kill me um, because I just got past saying no to bagels and now I have to say no to like coffee cake. So if you all could eat that for me this morning, that would be tremendous. Um, I wanted to welcome you all to Risen King. My name's Ashley. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that if you joined us last weekend for Father's Day weekend, we gave out travel coffee mugs. And as promised, the decals are here. So if you'd like one, you can pick one up at the info desk. Also, if you didn't get a mug, uh, we have lots left over. So feel free to take one today. Um, if you're visiting with us this morning, we just want to say welcome. There's a few ways to get connected here at Risen King. You can visit us online at risenking.life. You can also visit us at the info desk and fill out a getting to know you card. It's just a real simple way that we can kind of get to know one another. Um, I have a few events and things that I want to tell you about this morning. The first one is, um, are these connect events that we have throughout the year. You all have been in our parking lot on a Sunday morning, so you know how tight our services run. Um, so it's very difficult for us to get to connect with some of the new-ish folks that we have here at Risen King. And so what we've done is we've tried to create space for that. So next Saturday, after our Saturday night service, we're offering dinner for those who want to stick around and have dinner with us and meet some of our leadership team. Um, and also next Next Sunday after this service, after the third service, there will be lunch downstairs with some of our leaders as well. So if you consider yourself to be new-ish, uh, we'd love to invite you to have a meal with us and on us. It's free food, so don't want to forget that. Um, also, if you're interested in membership here at Risen King, um, today after this service, there's a membership meeting downstairs uh, with some of the elders here at Risen King. So if you're interested in finding out more about what membership means and what it looks like here, we'd love for you to stay after this service downstairs and, and find out more. Uh, coming up, we have a baptism service, and baptism service is, is probably my favorite service of the year at Risen King. Uh, we usually do it as part of our worship night series, which take place in August, uh, and this is just an awesome time for people to not only come out to be baptized, but even as a congregation to come out and hear the stories of transformation and what God has done in people's lives. And so uh, we want to let you know that this service is August 25th here at the church at 530, but if you're interested in being being baptized, you can sign up. There's a sign-up sheet at the info desk. You can also sign up online at risenking.life, and we'll just send you more details and information as that gets closer. Uh, in your bulletins over the last couple weeks, there was this flyer. It's not in your bulletin this week because the environment, um, but you can find this flyer out at the uh, in the lobby with all of the 15 different groups that are being offered here at Risen King. Uh, I just wanted to take a second and highlight a couple of them. The first one I wanted to highlight is a book study called The Secrets of the Vine, and this is a book study for women that will take place here at the church on Wednesday nights. And this idea of, of moving from fruitlessness to abundance. So ladies, if you're interested in that, you can sign up by filling out one of these forms or by visiting us at risenking.life. Also, there's a book study um, called Experiencing Intimacy with God, and that's Tuesday mornings here at the church, and this is this idea about knowing God and being known by God. So we'd love for you to check out those two book studies. Uh, the other group I wanted to highlight, this one's hard for me to announce, is our young adults group meetup. And let me tell you why this is difficult for me, is because when Pastor Isaiah was sharing his desire to create a young adults space, um, I had, up until this point, considered myself to be a young adult. And he was like, you know, I don't want, like, 30-year-olds signing up. And I was a little like, uh. So up until this moment, it was, like, earth-shaking for me to realize that I no longer fit in this category. But I may just show up just because I want to know, you know, what do young adults do if I'm not one? Because I still think that I 
probably am. Anyway, um, if you're interested in this group, if you consider yourself to be a young adult, we'd love for you to visit risenking.life and find out more or connect with Pastor Isaiah. Uh, at this time, we're going to move into a time of giving. There's a few ways to give here at Risen King. You can give online at risenking.life. There's a number in your bulletin that you can actually text to give. Um, or in just a few moments, we'll open up the front and you can give in the basket. So I'm just going to pray over the offering and then, and then we'll sing one more song together and, and we can go into a time of giving. So Father, we thank you that we can speak the name of Jesus over any and all situations in our lives. And so, Father, we do that now. We speak the name of Jesus, the power and authority that comes with that name over every person and every situation in this room. Father, we speak the name of Jesus over our tithes and our offering, and we ask that these gifts would be used for your glory and for your kingdom. We ask that this time would, that you would see it as worship, Lord. We give to you as an act of worship. We ask for your hand upon it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can feel free to come to the front as we sing one more song together. Hey guys, good morning everybody. Didn't the worship team do a great job leading us this morning? Uh-oh. Oh, I caught it on my foot. Um, they, do a, they did a great job and I love, I love uh, getting the chance to sit on that side of the stage and enjoy worship. Don't get me wrong, I love leading worship weekend after weekend, but I love sitting out there and just being able to enjoy it and experience it with, with all you guys and Kara and the team did a great job as always. So... Um, uh, I'm, I'm preaching this morning. Pastor Mike just finished a, a nine-week series called Knowing God. It was a great series. If you missed any of that or all of that, check it out on iTunes. There's a number of ways you can get it online, but iTunes and YouTube is one of them. So typically, we create a uh, sermon series graphic when we're going to start a series of like eight sermons or so. But today, the message is a one-part series. It starts today and ends today. <laughs> and so I thought... Why not just throw up the cover of our Risen King worship album is the, uh, is the sermon series graphic for today. So what you're seeing there is uh, Risen King Church, our very own worship team, released a worship album last week, about a week and a half ago now. Has it been that long? Maybe two weeks. I don't even know what day it is. About, about a week and a half ago. So it's available on all those platforms that you see right there. Okay, so I slipped in a little shameless promotion in the beginning. <laughs> beginning of my sermon. So the truth is, uh, the topic today is worship, something that's so near and dear to my heart. So we're going to look at uh, worship, scriptural basis for it, why it exists, what we're doing when we're singing to God, and then all the benefits, what happens when we worship. And uh, to kick things off, we're going to read just a short passage. It's on your screen. It's also on the, uh, the program in front of you. So you could read along on the front cover if you'd like or right off the screen. If you want to read out loud with me, feel free. I won't be mad either way. Okay? You can do either one, read or not read, but follow along. Acts 16, verses 22 through 26. The judges went along with the mob, had Paul and Silas's clothes ripped off, and ordered a public beating. After beating them black and blue, they threw them into jail, telling the jailkeeper to put them under heavy guard so there would be no chance of escape. He did just that, threw them into the maximum security cell in the jail and clamped leg irons on them. Along about midnight, Paul and Silas were at a prayer and singing a robust hymn to God. 
The other prisoners couldn't believe their ears. Then, without warning, a huge earthquake. The jailhouse tottered. Every door flew open. All the prisoners were loose. Let's pray before we jump into the message today. Father, uh, I thank you so much for this opportunity to be in your house, to be in your presence. Lord, I thank you for this word. Um, I, I pray, Father, that we would all hear your word today. And that it would take deep root in our lives, that we would leave different than we came in, that we would experience real change in our lives and our hearts after we encounter your truth. Lord, I fully admit and submit that none of this is possible without you. So we ask for your presence to be here and to move on our hearts. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. So I want to start off with just uh, the first few minutes are just going to be sort of a scriptural basis for why we worship, uh, why it's commanded, where it's commanded, when to worship. It's going to feel a little bit more like a lesson, but we'll move through that. And then eventually we're going to get to an Old Testament story that drives the point home really in a powerful way. So whether you've been in church your whole life or you're pretty new to coming to church, you're pretty new to the faith, maybe you're even just visiting for the first time, I think it's so important that we all understand why we sing, why we make music, why we, why we stand up. You know, has anybody ever asked you or have you ever thought to yourself, why do we stand up and face the front and sing words on a screen? And what are we singing about? And who are we singing to? I think it's important that we have a good answer for that. The answer should not be, I don't know, we just always do it. <laughs> you know, we should have a, a scriptural basis for that. So the first thing we're looking at is in 1 Peter 2.9. And it says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies or praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I think the, the scriptural basis there is so clear, and we could go to a number, dozens of verses that call on us, that command us, direct us to sing or to shout, or to proclaim the praises of our God. And this is just one of them. So we sing, and we shout, and, and we speak these praises out because it's commanded in Scripture right here. So um, saying that I don't like to sing is no longer a valid excuse. No, I'm just kidding. Kind of kidding. Um, not everybody loves to sing, and I get that. You know, some people don't want to sing because they're embarrassed about their voice, or they don't think they have a good voice. Trust me when I say this. Your voice is beautiful to the Lord. He loves to hear his children sing and open their mouth and proclaim these praises. And you don't have to only sing in the shower. You can sing at church as well. That's why we turn the music up so loud. <laughs> so nobody has to be embarrassed. Just kidding. Um, and then I want to look at why, why is it commanded. And there's a couple reasons. One. In Exodus 20, verse 3 through 5, it's a kind of a famous passage. Uh, uh, God speaking to his people here, and he says, I'm a jealous God, and I don't want you to have any other idols and, or any other gods. I don't want you to bow down. I don't want you to serve or worship any other God. I am God alone. You know, and at first glance, you might hear that, that phrase, I'm a jealous God, and you go, wait a minute, I thought jealousy was like a negative quality here. Um, how could this be true of God? And, and this is the way that I uh, have connected. Think about your own earthly relationships, particularly if you're married or if you hope to be married one day. Would you want your spouse, the person you've confessed your undying love for, would you want them to share that love and adoration they have with you with someone else? Would, they, would, would you want their love to be split between you and some other man or woman? Not at all. The answer is clear. And so in that same regard, God doesn't want his people to worship any other God. He created us and he desires that we would praise and worship him. Here's the other reason why worship is commanded. Because this is so true. I, I guarantee this is true. And if you, if you look in your own life, you'll see that it's true at different times. It'll be so clear to you. We become like whatever it is we worship. Whatever you worship, you're going to start to look like that thing. When you worship money, you're going to see greed and materialism in your life. When you worship power, you'll see corruption. Turn on CNN or Fox News. 
you'll see this play out. There's a lot of power-hungry people on those channels. Got real quiet in here. <laughs> and, and, you know, power, these people that are so power-hungry, they've made that their ultimate thing. I'm not saying all politicians are bad at all. I, I'm just saying that when we've made power our ultimate thing and we've decided to worship power, you're going to see corruption take place. When you worship sex, you become filled with lustful and perverted and sexually immoral desires. It'll consume you. When you worship fame, you, when you elevate yourself above everyone else and even try to place yourself where only God belongs, you're going to see that you become an east, egotistical, self-serving individual. And, and, and it's really not a pretty thing at all. It's so s destructive, that kind of mentality, egotism. But here's, here's what's so great. When we worship Christ, we become more like Christ. We become Christ-like the more we worship. I'm telling you the truth today. Whatever you worship, you will become like that thing. Amen? You guys with me? Okay. So now we looked at it's commanded in Scripture and why it's commanded. We're going to look at now what happens when we worship. There's a few things that happen. And here's just a couple to start off with. Our vision of God is expanded through our worship. And I'll tell you what I mean by this. The psalmist in chapter 8, verse 3 says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? So the psalmist is thinking about creation, and he worships God as creator. So now when he sees the moon and the stars, it's just not... Uh, just another, oh, there's another nice night or there's another pretty sky. But now he sees God in those things. It gives purpose to what can become the mundane things of life. Now, I, this is huge for me, worshiping God as my creator, because have you ever met those people that say that they really connect with God through nature? You know, maybe through taking a hike or being out in nature, being out in the wilderness, if that's you, would you raise your hand if you connect with God that way? Okay, I am not that way. I Think about that. I'm the opposite. Some people say, well, I connect with God through a hike. I don't take hikes unless there's a prize at the end of the trail. You know, if there's a cheeseburger and fries waiting for me, I might take the hike. Other than that, not at all. But this is why this is huge for me because as I worship God as my creator, I start to see God and worship him when I see his creation. And so it expands our vision of God. Here's the other thing that happens when our vision is expanded. The psalmist, right after his vision is expanded as God the creator, he has a fresh revelation of the Father's love for him. He says, and who am I that you are mindful of me? That's not negative self-talk. He's saying, this is amazing. The God who created the moon and the stars loves me and has me in mind. So as our vision expands, we're, uh, the Father's heart for us is revealed. Here's the other thing that happens when we worship God. And this is so huge, and I'm going to ask you to say it with me in a minute. When our praises go up, God comes down. Can we say that together? When our praises go up, God comes down. If you forget everything else, I want you to remember that. That when our worship and our praise go up to heaven, God visits with us. His manifest presence comes down. It's all over Scripture. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And we're going to see, as you see on your screen, a few different uh, places where we see this played out. We already read, to open up with today, the short story from Paul and Silas. Um, when their praises went up, they experienced freedom. That little story about them being arrested and then put in prison and then the prison is opened up and they're able to go free, that's a nice little cute story. But... That's only nice and cute if it didn't happen to you. <laughs> but once it, you put yourself there and you think, these men were beaten black and blue, the translation we read said. Black and blue. They were beaten senseless, really to within an inch of their life. They were beaten with rods and whips, stripes all over their back. This was not a slap on the wrist. After they were beaten, they were thrown into a jail, and not just any jail, if you go deep into the text, actually the cell, the inner jail cell where they were placed was another word for that is dungeon. So they were placed in the darkest, 
dampest, most cut off, desolate place imaginable in this jail. And we're talking turn of the century. So this is not like the Marriott Federal Prison, you know. This is like a dungeon dungeon. I'm sure the bathroom facilities were not up to par. And this is where they are. Now, the last thing I just want to bring this to reality is it said they were put in chains. But they weren't just like handcuffed with a long leash of a chain or anything else like that. They were actually put in stocks. And the stocks were fastened against the wall. And they were, their hands were spread all the way apart like this. Stocks, hands in either uh, stock. And then their feet were in stocks as well, right around their ankles. And it was positioned in a way so that they could get no rest. They couldn't just stand and lean against the wall. But they were actually suspended so that their wrists and their feet were, were in constant agony, bearing the whole load of their weight, of their body weight. This is where they're placed. And I think about that, and I'm like, if that was me, I don't think I would be praying and singing at midnight. <laughs> I can think of a few other things I might be doing. I might be crying. <laughs> I, I, I might be saying a few different things. But I don't know if I'd be singing and praying. But these men were unlike any other prisoners that that jail had ever seen before. It says that the other prisoners couldn't believe their ears because what was coming from this inner cell, this dungeon, was not cries for help, not cries of pain. It wasn't cursing or complaining or begging. It was prayers and singing. That's what was coming from these two prisoners as they hung there in anguish. They didn't get their one phone call to their lawyer like you or I would get, but they had a direct line to heaven. And they picked up that direct line. They prayed straight to God and they sang and praised his holy name. And do you know what happened? Right about midnight, it says an earthquake came, the chains fell off, and the door flung open. Is anybody else excited about that? I mean, this is the God we serve. I think that's so incredible. And I want to I want to tell you today, church is not about hearing about what God did in the past and just saying, oh, that's nice. I believe so strongly that coming here together, fellowshipping together, is so that we can encounter God and experience that same level of freedom in our own lives. I want to tell you this morning, you're not here by accident. There's chains that are on you that God would love to break off of you. There's jail cell doors that have been shut and locked that he wants to fling wide open today. You guys just say that, say, fling them open, Lord. <laughs> we want more of his freedom. The other, the other thing, the way that God uh, manifests himself when we sing, when our praises go up and he comes down, real quickly, I don't want to go into as much detail as the previous story, but in 1 Samuel chapter 16, you can read the whole story if you'd like. King Saul, the king of God's people, is going through a uh, mental health issue. <laughs> he had, he's filled with anxiety and paranoia. The word even says that he had an evil spirit that would come and torment his mind. He could get no rest and no peace. The only thing that brought him rest or peace while he's going through this difficult time is when a teenage kid named David came to the king and started to play a guitar. Although it was an old guitar, so they called it a harp. But it was a stringed instrument. So this teenage kid, he was probably 13, 14, maybe 15 at this time, comes into the presence of his king and plays this harp. And David was a young man after God's own heart. He had already spent countless hours praising and worshiping his Lord. And as he played, peace came to Saul's mind. I want to tell you this morning, if you've got a troubled mind at all, if anxiety or panic or paranoia, if fear has been gripping you, if you felt like you can't get any relief mentally, I'm telling you today that there is a peace that passes all understanding. And you know how this is unlocked? The freedom that we see in Paul and Silas, the, the, um, the peace that we see with King Saul, you know how it's unlocked in Scripture? Through singing and worshiping to God, praising to God. That's how it's unlocked. The last thing on your screen, King Jehoshaphat. We're going to look at his story in a minute. Uh, we're, going to, we're going to save that towards the end because I want to go into a little bit more debt. But I want you to remember this. When our praises go up, God comes down. If you ever ask yourself, when is the right time to worship? 
The answer is always all the time. Have you ever questioned, I wonder if I should worship right now? It's an easy answer. Yes. <laughs> so you worship on the mountaintop when everything's going right, and you worship in the valley when nothing's going right. You worship in the middle of the battle. You worship before the battle. You worship after the battle. You give God praise continually. At all times and all things, give him praise. It is amazing what God can accomplish for us in his presence. We could try our hardest to win a battle. Like we could spend our whole life trying to win a battle. God can win that battle in an instant in his presence. So we could strive. We could freak out. We could pour all of our resources into something. But at the end of the day, we're called to, to engage in one battle, and that's worshiping our Father in heaven, giving him praise, and then watch him come down and deliver every time. I was thinking about a, a team that wins a Super Bowl or maybe even an artist that wins an Oscar or a Grammy. You know, the winner, more often than not, always says, I'd like to give thanks to God, right? But what I'd like to, you know, I think that's easy. You know, give me a Grammy. I'll give thanks to God, too. <laughs> give me that Super Bowl championship paycheck. Uh, let me win the lottery. I'll tithe on it, and then I'll give thanks to God. That was a joke, guys. I'll tithe on the check, you know. Anyways, um, but what I'd like to see is the interview in the losing team's locker room after the Super Bowl. Are they giving thanks to God, even in defeat, even in disappointment, even when life didn't go the way you wanted it to go, even in uh, um, loss and shock? Are they giving thanks to God? Because I think that's the true test. It's easy to give thanks to God when everything's going smooth. But are we giving thanks to God in all seasons and all circumstances? Now, along those same lines, here's, here's a very important principle. God has not called us to be fake. So if I went into that losing team's locker room and I said, you know, how do you feel? And they just said, well, I'm blessed. And they had a big smile on their face. I'd say they're probably not really in, in uh, grips with reality. You know, I think the appropriate response, I kind of have a silly example of, of losing your job. Not that silly, but... Uh, if you just lost your job and then you come to church the next day and I know you just lost your job, but I say, how you doing, man? And you go, I'm blessed. And I'm like, I want to just smack him in the face and say, stop being fake. Be real. God's asking for us to be real. He's not asking for us to be fake. He can handle our disappointment. Um, he can handle our pain and our loss. I think the honest response to losing the Super Bowl or, or losing a job would be something like this at the bottom of your screen. Lord, this hurts. This disappointment and shock is tough. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you're doing. I'm asking you to lead me through this. I trust you. You didn't bring me this far to let me down now. This is the honest approach. Jesus said in John, when he's talking to his followers, the time is coming when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. He's looking for honest hearts. He's not looking for you to be fake. I'm not asking you that when you've had a bad day or a bad week to come in here with a fake smile on your face, hands clapping and jumping for joy. But approach the Lord honestly and see him meet you in that moment. Just to drive that point home, David, and I'll do this real quick because I want to get to our story. But David, the psalmist, is uh, going through a really difficult time in Psalm 22. He's got enemies pursuing him. He's hiding. And he pins one of the most uh, um, interesting, in-depth looks at uh, what it means to pour your heart out to God in a lamenting way. He's not complaining about God. The psalm doesn't read that he goes to his best friends and says, I'm so mad at God. Can you believe what he's letting me go through right now? He's not complaining about God. He's talking to God. It almost sounds like for a few verses that he's complaining to God. Lord, I don't know what's going on. What are you doing here? The, the psalm is named the Psalm of the Cross because the opening lines of Psalm 22 are, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Anybody ever hear those words before? These are the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. Some translations have Psalm 22 ending with, It is finished. Another line that we hear on the cross. So some commentators and theologians believe that Jesus may have recited this whole psalm on the cross, Psalm 22. So here's David pouring out his heart to God, worshiping him honestly, 
But aren't you so glad that we serve a God that takes a pile of ashes and makes something beautiful out of it? He's a God who restores. So the very next psalm is one of the most comforting, peace-giving pieces of, of literature that I've ever read, that maybe you've ever read. Psalm 23. I want you to hear this and, and receive it this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. You just say, Lord, I receive that. <laughs> we could spend an hour unpacking that psalm. But man, that is one of the most comforting, peace-giving, life-giving things we can read and scriptures that we can read. That even though I'm in the valley of the shadow of death, even though I'm in a dark hour, I know you're with me and you comfort me. I love that picture. And that's what God does. When we approach him honestly, I think he brings us to this place where he takes ashes and turns it into something beautiful. Quickly, before we get to our story, why does worship work? I couldn't think of a better word than work, but why does worship work so well? Well, because Satan hates worship. He was, he was created as the, the first worship leader before he fell, before he rebelled against God and fell from heaven. He was the worship leader. So he knows how powerful worship is. He knows this is why you and I were created, so that we could choose into this and serve God and worship him. And so that is why he loves to attack praise and worship. Now, I could, get, I could stand up here for hours and tell you stories about how myself as a worship leader or those on the team that are leading worship get attacked week in and week out. It's amazing how the enemy loves to try to keep us just from even getting here. You know, whether it's kids. For, for I remember a few years back, it seemed like every Saturday night my kids got sick in the middle of the night. And I was up all night, you know, trying to just keep me from being here. The, the, the enemy lo would love to attack this. But even all of us, even if you're not involved in leading worship, um, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And that's true even in worship. How many people... Uh, you can put your hand up if this is you. How many people, when you try to press into a worship service, you try to sing these songs, your mind is just a million different places and you can't focus in. You know, you got thoughts bouncing around all over your head. Or maybe if that's not you, maybe you even take it to take it a step further. Maybe even you, you hear lies. You hear the enemy or a voice inside your head saying, why would you sing this song? You know, I know what other song you were singing last week. Or, or I, I, you know, how could you, how could you lift your hands and say that you love God? I know what you did a couple days ago. How could you talk to God like that when I heard how you talk to your wife or your kids that way? These are condemning voices from the enemy that would love to just distract us from what we're called to do, which is worship our creator. Folks, when you hear those voices, rebuke it in Jesus' name. And I encourage you to press in. Press in. Keep going. Keep pursuing God. I'm telling you, being in his presence, it's better than anything on this earth. And this is where miracles happen. This is where breakthrough happens. This is where freedom happens. Amen? Amen. Um, real quick, I'll touch on this really, really quickly. Um, there are some incredible just natural benefits um, to listening to or, or singing or making music. Just natural benefits music. Uh, I was reading a few different articles, and it's amazing. In modern medicine and science, uh, more and more you're seeing people use music as a form of therapy. Even as a teacher, I was a public school teacher until last week. <laughs> a few days ago, I uh, officially ended my 10 years as a newer public school teacher. Yeah, thanks. And so now I'm full-time at the church. But even as a teacher, I would put on classical music in the background during a test or any other kind of activity just because of its calming effect. You know, it's hard 
um, when the kid, you know, normally stands up and wants to curse at you and throw something at you. It's hard to do that with Mozart playing in the background, you know. Just had a very calming, almost put him to sleep, right to sleep. Um, and, and so a lot, there's a lot of studies about the effects of music. Here's just a few that I came across. It's uh, been proven to improve he health and healing in general. It improves brain activity and facilitates memory recovery. Patients with Alzheimer's or dementia can hear a song from a certain era and a whole string of memories are triggered from that one song. It can lessen stress and calm anxiety and allow for better sleep and rest. And folks, this is like classical music, easy listening jazz, smooth jazz, whatever, whatever your preference is. So now imagine the benefits of music and I believe God created music. I know he created it. So he designed it to work that way. Imagine the combination of that with now declaring the praises and the promises of God over our life. I'm telling you, the benefits are endless. It's time to stop with the negative self-talk. It's time to stop listening to voices that are lies and condemning. It's time to start proclaiming the truth and the promise of God over our lives. Amen. And I'm telling you, I know not everybody loves to sing. I know that. But I want to encourage you to just step out and give it a shot. Um, uh, I, I wrote down, look at this, I'm using paper and pen, which is crazy. 2018, and I'm using paper and pen. I didn't, I didn't have time to put it on my slide, but I've got um, a few words on here that are translations in the Bible for the word praise and worship. There are three or four dozen different meanings to the word that we have as praise and worship in scripture. So I'm just going to read a few of them to jump, to be glad, to rejoice, to bend, to kneel, to lay down, to spin, to sing, to dance, to turn, to celebrate, to play instruments, to praise or rave about, to shout, to sing a new song. It says a new song. So anybody that's ever mad at me for picking too many new songs weekend after weekend, I'm just following scripture, okay? <laughs> to sing a new song or a spontaneous hymn, to extend your hands or raise your hands in worship. These are the translations for praise and worship. Um, I'm telling you now, I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to step on toes and there's no condemnation here. But I know for certain that God is calling so many of us, myself included, as I read this list, to go deeper in our worship journey with him and our expression of praise and worship. I'm not content with standing in one place and singing for the rest of my life. I'm not content with that. I want to start jumping and spinning and dancing around. Some of it you might see here at church and some of it I'll do on my own. I'll be honest, there's been times where I turn out all the lights. I'm here at church by myself. I'll turn out all the lights so that nobody thinks that anybody's here. And I'll twirl around the sanctuary or dance around. I look like a pretty big idiot. I make sure that live streams off so nobody can see me. <laughs> Stuff I probably wouldn't do here corporately. But I'm telling you folks, just go deeper. What have you got to lose? What's the worst? You know, I believe that God loves these um, uh, just lavish expressions of our worship. I, I believe that he takes so much pleasure when we step out of our comfort zone and we say, God, I'm willing to look like a fool for you. Amen? Amen. Now, as far as raising your hands, I remember I was about 11 years old when I first raised my hands in worship and I kept them down here like I was carrying a TV, you know, like this. <laughs> and that way, if somebody was standing next to me and saw and I thought that they were going to think I was an idiot, I could slip my hand in my pocket real quick. So I was like, how great. Our God. Oh, she's looking. Put my hand in my pocket, you know, like I was just. Slowly. And then as I got a little more comfortable with that, I raised them up and I uh, this pose is called hold the baby. And then this one we call Mufasa or the Lion King. And then finally, you can go full on uh, village people YMCA and. You can do the Rocky, anything you want, really. There's a lot of different hand positions. Find one that suits you and just go with it. You guys are supposed to laugh a little bit more at that. <laughs> it was all a joke, but it's true at the same time. I do encourage you to just take a step. It's baby steps. It's baby steps. It's just taking that first step and then seeing this worship experience grow. Because I believe God has designed it this way with music, with singing, 
with this expression of worship, it unlocks victory. It unlocks breakthrough. And when our praises go up, he comes down. Amen? Okay. Um, we're going to fly through this so I can get to the, the story. Um, this is how we fight our battles. I want to say this. Worship is how we fight our battles. I think sometimes if we are losing the battle or losing different battles in our life, I want to say this to you. You might be fighting the wrong battle. You might be fighting the wrong battle. God has called us to fight this battle, to praise and worship his name. And see, see, Paul and Silas, when they were hanging there in their stocks in that dungeon, they weren't plotting how they could escape. They weren't plotting how they could maybe take over the jailer or knock him out when he wasn't looking or anything like that. They weren't trying to fight that battle. They were fighting one battle, opening up their mouth and singing to God. And God did the rest. I'm telling you, folks, you want to catch that this morning. You might be fighting the wrong battle. You might spend, be spending all your time and energy trying to win on your own instead of just worshiping and praising God honestly, thanking him for what he's about to do, remembering what he's already done and declaring that to be true. Amen? In times of crisis, I think that it's often a song that we remember more than sometimes a scripture or a sermon. And so I can say this with confidence. Songs will do more for us than, and different things for us than sermons ever will. <laughs> I can say that now that I'm not just a worship leader and I preach from time to time. I've always believed that to be true, but I don't want to make Mike feel like uh, I was, you know, thinking of him as an inferior role. But songs, when, I, when a crisis hits or bad news hits, I remember a song before I remember a sermon point. I wake up in the morning with a song in my heart or in my head before I remember a talk or a scripture necessarily. And it's for that reason that it is so vitally important that we are singing the right songs, that we're singing songs that are in line with scripture. Amen? Okay, um, the last point I'm going to make before we get to the story is at the bottom of your screen. Some of you might be sitting there saying, well, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know the pain I'm dealing with. You don't know the struggle I'm dealing with. I'm facing an impossible circumstance. You tell me about anxiety and fear. Well, it's been in my family for generations. I can't win. Depression's been here for as long as I can remember. I can't get over it. My kids won't listen to me. They don't even like me. We don't even talk. So if that's you this morning and you say, this is what I'm dealing with. So how can I worship? My God, how can I celebrate and rejoice in him when I'm dealing with this? Uh, I want you to practice this. Envision the miracle or the breakthrough that you're looking for. Envision that already being done. Just imagine what that would be like if God broke that depression off of you instantaneously. Imagine what it would be like if that medical diagnosis got turned around and you were declared healed and whole. Imagine that and then worship him like it's already happened. Praise him like it's already done. See, if we wait until the victory's here to give thanks to God, we're going to be waiting a long time. We are called to praise him through the storm, in the middle of the battle, before the battle, at all times. Don't just wait till you're on the mountaintop. Praise him even in the valley. And that's how I want to encourage you to do it. Envision it like it's already done. All right, I think we're to our story one of my favorite stories in all of Scripture, um, and it's probably one of the top couple stories that you could use to illustrate how when we worship, God comes down. This is an exciting story, so I want you to make sure you're fully awake and on the edge of your seat for this. Picture this. King Jehoshaphat, the king of God's people, has a, a couple of his commanders come to him one day, and uh, they say, hey, we got some bad news. There's not one army, there's not two armies, there's three armies coming for you. They're coming for us. And they're not just in their land getting ready for battle. They're already ready, they're already marching, and they're in our country. They're basically in our backyard. Three armies in his backyard. Now, 
the fake response, imagine if he was fake and I turned around and said, King Jehoshaphat, how you doing? And he just said, I'm blessed. <laughs> I don't think that would be a realistic response. I'm so glad he didn't give the fake response. In verse 3, he gave a very real response. It says that he was terrified by this news, but he didn't stay there. He was terrified at first. He felt the real pain and the shock of this bad news. He doesn't stay there. He declares a fast for all of God's people. And he brings all of the people of the land together, declares a fast, and they pray together. And I want to look at his prayer. We're going to skip a few verses. So in verse 5 and 6, he begins the prayer. And he says, Lord, this is what you've done in the past. And then if you get down to like 7 and 8, um, he, said, he reminds the Lord what he has called them to. He said, you called us to this land. Why would you call us here if you were now just going to let us get wiped out? So he says, you called us here, and you said you'd be by our side. And then in verse 10, he, he presents the problem. This is a formula that I believe you could follow in your own life. Give thanks to God for what he's done in the past. Remind the Lord, and you're really reminding yourself of what he's called you to. And now present your request. Lord, there's these three armies. So what does that look like for you? God, my marriage is a wreck. God, my, you know, my, my job is not going well. Lord, I, for some reason, I can't get on the same page with my spouse. We're just fighting nonstop. Lord, these financial struggles are so great. I don't know how I'm going to deal with them. Whatever your request is, present it to God. And now here's the key. This is what he says. It's such a posture of humility in verse 12. He says, oh, our God, won't you stop them? We are powerless against this mighty army that is about to attack us. We do not know what to do, but we are looking to you for help. Another translation says it this way. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. This is a prayer I've prayed countless times. God, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are on you. Even when I don't know what to do, I know who, know, who does know what to do. And guess what? His eyes are always on you as well. He never takes his eyes off of you. So after this, he makes this prayer. A prophet stands up and says, I've heard from God. This is God's message to us, his people. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. Take heart. The Lord is going to fight for you. He says, you're going to go out and you're going to see victory, but you're not even going to have to fight. We'll skip a few more. So King Jehoshaphat, here's that prophet. Now, that's an easy prophecy to receive, amen? <laughs> that wasn't a condemning prophecy. You know, here's three armies coming for you, and a guy stands up and says, God says we're going to win. I'm like, I'll take it. Amen to that. <laughs> I know that's right. And so the king takes the prophet at his word, believes the, the message from God, believe it's true. And now here's the point where me personally, I'm so thankful that I was not a singer in the Old Testament because King Jehoshaphat says, I have a bright idea. Let's put all the singers on the front lines. I'm so glad. If that was me, I would have woke up saying, I'm a little hoarse today. I don't think you want me singing. I might go off key or my voice might crack a little bit. So he says, let's put all the singers up front. And uh, they march out to the place where, um, where God told them to go. In, let's see, what verse are we on? Here's the song that the singers are singing. You know, they're, they're not singing a song, uh, something like, gee, I hope, I hope God really loves us. <laughs> That's not the song they're singing. They're not singing, oh, I hope his promises really are yes and amen. I hope he really can do this. I hope he really is powerful. That's not the song they're singing. They're giving thanks to God. In the face of this imminent danger and certain defeat, they're singing this, give thanks to the Lord. His faithful love endures forever. Now look at the very next verse. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, and I'll stop there. At the very moment they began to sing and give praise, that's when God shows up. This is so true for your life. We just saw it with Paul and Silas. And now we're seeing it for God's people in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. The moment they began to sing and give praise is when God shows up. When our praises go up, God comes down. Could you guys say that? When our praises go up, God comes down. At that moment. Now I'll paraphrase. The three armies that were coming together to attack, 
they got mad at each other and two armies ganged up on one of the other ones and wiped them out. And then the two armies that are left then turn on each other and wipe each other out. And the, the, the story says that when the people of God get up to the place where he told them to go, they look out on the body, battlefield and it's completely empty. There's not one living soldier left. Every one of their enemies had been defeated and they never picked up a sword. They didn't pick up a sword. They won the battle, but they didn't even fight because God won it for them. I'm telling you right now, the truth here that we need to catch is that God, what God does for us on the battlefield with his sword is released through what we do with our voice and with our hands. The song that we sing, the music that we make, this is how he's designed it, that this is what unlocks his victory. This is what unlocks uh, miracles and breakthrough. I mean, three armies, it's hard for us to even fathom because we don't live in that time period of kingdoms and kings and conquests and taking over territory. But three armies coming at you, you're as good as dead. You may as well start running away. But they send the worshipers out front. I'm telling you this morning, I know for certain some of us here have been fighting the wrong battles. We've been trying to pick up swords and spears when God called us to just open our mouth and sing and praise. Uh, prophetically, I want to say this to you this morning. Lay down the sword. Lay down the weapon. Stop trying to fight the battle on your own. Open your mouth. Give praise to God. Because then he comes down. And when he comes down, we're in his presence. And in his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence is peace that passes all understanding. I know that this is true. Amen. Would you guys stand with me in closing? The way this story ends, I'm going to read that last verse, just one verse at the bottom of your screen. The way this story ends, it says, So Jehoshaphat's kingdom was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. After God wiped out three armies, every other nation heard about that, and they were like, I'm not messing with them. <laughs> These guys just sang. <laughs> they didn't even pick up a sword. And, and, uh, and their Lord delivered victory for them. So nobody wanted to mess with them, and it says that there were, he was at peace, and there was rest on every side. That's for you this morning. God has peace for you. And he has rest on every side. I'm not talking about that he wants you to see victory in one battle. He wants you to see victory on every side. He wants you to have complete and total freedom. If your mind has been troubled, if your spirit or your soul has been downtrodden and depressed, he has peace for you. And he has rest. If you felt like you've been dodging five different arrows at once just attacks from all these different places there's rest and peace for you on every side we're going to do this last thing to close today i believe when we approach god and worship if we can remember these few things um, it, it'll really help us keep perspective of how we are to worship him how we are to declare his promises for us over our lives I want to encourage you to not just pray, of course pray, but not just pray, but would you sing over your life? You can do it in the car when nobody else is around. Would you sing over your family, sing over your marriage, sing over your kids, sing over your, your family, your community, your job? I do it almost every day I do it. I sing over so many of you. I sing over every one of you because I sing over this church. When we get requests for care and prayer at this church, we don't just lift you up in prayer. I sing over you. I say, Lord, I've seen you move mountains, and I know you'll do it again for them. I know your promise still stands for them. I know that that marriage is healed. I know that you're going to heal that sickness or that disease. I know you're going to find the right job or the right home for them. Folks, I want to encourage you to do that. We Number one, we praise him for who he is. He is good at all times and all things and every situation. He is good. You never have to question that. 
Number two, we praise him for what he's already done. Jesus' blood shed for us on the cross, paid it all. There's nothing too great for him. No sin, no mistake, no sickness or disease is too great for his blood. Declare that he will rescue you today, that nothing is impossible with our God. Three armies, <laughs> three armies, nothing's impossible. Chains, they were in a dungeon and they were set free. Nothing's impossible. And finally, receive this from the Lord today. Would you be at peace? Receive his peace and find rest on every side. Say this after me. Put your hands out if you don't mind and say this after me. God, you are good. Jesus, your blood paid it all. Nothing is impossible for you. I receive your peace. I receive your rest on every side. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God praise today. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that to be true. I encourage you to keep declaring that and singing that over your life. Thank you for being here this morning. I'll hang out. A few other people will hang out if you want to talk or pray up front. Have a great rest of your uh, day, guys. Thanks. Bye.